Welcome, and thank you all for standing by. At this time, I would like to inform all participants that your lines have been placed on a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's call. Today's call is also being recorded. If anyone has any objections, you may disconnect at this time. And I would now like to turn the call over to Mr. Ben Haynes. Sir, you may begin. Thank you, Sue, and thank you for joining us today for this embargoed briefing to update you on CDC's COVID-19 response. All of the information included today is embargoed for 1 p.m. Eastern Time. We are joined today by CDC Director Dr. Robert Redfield and CDC's COVID-19 Incident Manager Dr. Jay Butler. Dr. Redfield and Dr. Butler will discuss CDC's updates on who is at higher risk for severe illness due to COVID-19. Following their remarks, Dr. Dana Meany Delman will join us for the questions and answers. At this time, I'd like to turn the call over to Dr. Redfield. Thank you, Ben, and thank you all for joining us today. When Dr. Butler and I talked to you last, we spoke about the need to understand and consider your personal risk and the situations in your community. As states continue to adjust mitigation efforts, I want to remind you about how to protect yourself, your family, and your community in advance of the 4th of July holiday. While the past few weeks saw cases begin to trend downwards, there are a number of states across the United States, particularly in the southeast and southwest, that are seeing increases. Evidence tells us that these increases are driven by many factors, including outbreaks in settings that are particularly challenges, as well as increased testing and community transmission as well. In addition, in some instances, the hospitalizations are going up as people seek care for non-COVID-related health issues as well as COVID-19. CDC is closely monitoring these in increases and currently have deployed well over 100 staff to more than 20 or so states, including those states seeing these increases to support the state and local health officials. We continue to work to get information we need to understand the complexities of this disease and share that with the public. We can't lose sight of the fact that this pandemic is caused by a new virus that was totally unknown to us just a year ago. And we will continue to refine guidelines on how we can best reduce the risk of infection based on data and science. As we move forward and each of us weigh our risk of infection and make decisions about how to go about our lives, it's important for all of us to try the best we can to continue to take steps that we know are effective in preventing COVID-19. For those at higher risk, we recommend limiting contacts with others as much as possible or restricting contacts to a small number of people who are willing to take measures to reduce the risk of becoming infected. In other words, when you must go out into the community, being in contact with few people is better than many. Shorter periods are better than longer. And contact at greater distance, ideally at least six feet, are better than closer. Everyone can take these steps to protect themselves, their family, and their communities, but they are particularly important for people who are at higher risk and for people who live with and care for individuals at higher risk. In summary, the keys to COVID prevention remain. Number one, social distancing. Number two, frequent hand washing and hand hygiene. Number three, staying away from others if you're ill. And number four, properly wearing a face covering when you're unable to social distance. I want to share with you some other important news. After gathering and thoroughly reviewing the most current evidence, CDC is updating its information that we're providing about people who are at the higher risk of severe outcomes from COVID-19. First, we want to be clear about what we think puts people at higher risk for severe disease, hospitalization, intensive care, and even death. We know that the risk is a continuum. It's not just the risk of those ages 65 and older. And based on what we've learned, we now understand that as you get older, your risk for severe disease, hospitalization, and death increases. We also updated the list of underlying health conditions that can put you at higher risk for severe disease, hospitalization, and death 
based on the latest review of scientific evidence to date. A key point is that we want to make sure that people know that as your numbers of underlying medical conditions increase, your risk of severe illness from COVID also increases. I'd like to turn it over now to Dr. Jane Butler, our COVID-19 incident manager, to provide further discussion on these issues. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Dr. Redfield, and good afternoon or good morning, everyone. It's good to be able to speak with you again. Uh, let me provide a bit more detail about the update to the underlying medical conditions that increase one's risk for a severe outcome due to COVID-19. First, as Dr. Redfield mentioned, we know that the risk of severe illness from COVID-19 increases progressively with increasing age. Or to put it another way, there's not an exact cutoff of age at which people should or should not be concerned. Second, we want to reiterate and update information about which underlying health conditions put people at higher risk. Part of the reason why risk increases with age is because as people get older, they are more likely to have other health issues that may place them at higher risk. We reviewed the evidence related to each of these conditions and determined whether there was strong, mixed, or limited evidence whether they were associated with increased risk of more severe illness, which may be measured by hospitalization, ICU admission, or death. The underlying conditions for which there is the strongest evidence of higher risk are cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, such as emphysema, obesity, that is a body mass index of more than 30, any immunosuppressing condition or treatment, sickle cell disease, history of organ transplant, and type 2 diabetes. We also clarified a list of conditions that might increase the risk of severe illness. Some of these conditions include other chronic lung diseases, such as moderate to severe asthma and cystic fibrosis, high blood pressure, a weakened immune system, as may occur among persons after blood, blood or bone marrow transplant, immune deficiency, poorly controlled HIV infection, or use of other immune weakening medicines. Another is neurologic conditions such as dementia or history of stroke, liver disease, and pregnancy. Let me say a bit more about that last one. Today we'll be publishing an MMWR that compares data on pregnant and non-pregnant women with laboratory confirmed COVID-19. Based on analysis of these surveillance data, Pregnant women with COVID-19 were more likely to be admitted to the ICU and also to receive mechanical ventilation than were non-pregnant women. Based on the data available now, it does not appear that pregnant women are at higher risk of death from COVID-19. We are, we are collecting additional information and we're working to find out if COVID-19 is associated with pregnancy complications. As always, we're sharing these updates and others as we learn more so that you can have the best, most current science-based information to help all of us make decisions about how to protect ourselves, our families, and our communities. We want to live as safely as we can and minimize the risk of COVID-19 while it is circulating. As Dr. Redfield mentioned earlier, each person has to make decisions about what level of risk they're comfortable with as we go about our daily lives. CDC is committed to providing science-based information about how everyone can reduce the risk. Now I'll turn it back to Ben, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Dr. Butler, and thank you, Dr. Redfield. Sue, we are now ready to take questions. Thank you. One moment, please. In order to provide everyone the opportunity to ask questions, we do ask that you limit your questions to one question and one follow-up. If you do have any further questions, simply reinsert yourself back into the queue and your additional questions will be answered as time permits. To ask a question, please ensure that your phone is unmuted, press star 1, and record your name clearly. If you wish to withdraw your question, press star 2. Again, to ask a question, please press star 1. One moment for the first question. 
The first question is from Eben Brown with Fox News. You may go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Thank you for doing this. Um, uh, I'm speaking to you from Florida, where we've had another day of 5,000 plus uh, uh, new positive cases. Um, uh, this uh, number has uh, we've seen similar numbers in other southern states. Um, now the northeastern states are imposing a uh, mandatory quarantine for anyone who travels from here to there. It's something that uh, Florida did to the northeastern states a couple of months ago. Um, are these quarantines uh, really going to be effective? Is there that much migration uh, between the, the two regions that it's really going to cause a problem, or, or is the problem for these surges elsewhere? You know, thank you for your question. Um, I think the, the comment that I will make is that um, uh, clearly we have seen, as you commented in the uh, southern states, some increases in cases. Uh, you know, I keep trying to remind people that uh, the real focus is the consequence of those cases, particularly hospitalizations, uh, mortality, and death. Obviously, the also consequences in terms of the disruption of the economy, education system, et cetera. Um, so I, I don't think we have any clear evidence. As you know, right now, the individual states are making their individual decisions. I think your, your, the, the tone of your question, which is good, is I think we don't have any evidence-based data to support the public health value of that decision. Um, obviously, it's an independent decision that independent governors are going to make. Great. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Helen Branswell with STAT. You may go ahead. Hi, thank you very much for taking my question and for doing this. Um, I'm wondering if CDC is concerned that uh, the public may be getting mixed messages about the risk of COVID-19 transmission at this point. Um, you know, uh, the president is telling people that the, the virus is receding, and yet it clearly is not in parts of the country. As a consequence, it seems like a lot of people are um, no longer following the sort of prudent social distancing measures that are really needed to drive back transmission of the virus. Does this concern you all? I'm going to make a comment and then ask Jay to follow up with his perspective. I think um, uh, obviously that we're seeing right now uh, infections that are targeting younger individuals. As you know, in Florida, uh, a significant number of the infections, and actually in the southeast and southwest, are in individuals now uh, that are younger than the age of 50. I think, Helen, one of the points I want to make is um, in the past, I just don't think we diagnose these infections. CDC has completed um, a series and will continue to do fairly extensive surveillance throughout the nation using antibody testing. And our best estimate right now is that for every case that was reported, there actually were 10 other infections. But in the past, we didn't really aggressively pursue diagnostics in young asymptomatic individuals. So that's the first thing I want to say is, you know, how much of what we're seeing now uh, was occurring and just unrecognized because now we're getting a younger population to get diagnosed. But I will say I am uh, remain concerned about trying to understand the effective public health messaging that we need to get to those individuals that are say, under the age of 45, under the age of 30, uh, whereas the uh, impact and consequences of COVID infection on them may not be highly associated with hospitalization and death, uh, they do uh, uh, act as a transmission uh, connector for individuals that could, in fact, be at higher risk. So trying to understand the effectiveness and the last thing I'll say on this and turn it to Jay, because this is one of the reasons I think it's important that we really have the data at a granular level. When you look right now at some of the maps you've seen on television, you know, it looks like a substantial portion of the United States is red. But in reality, we have probably about 110, 120 counties that we consider uh, as having significant transmission. We refer them 
to them as hotspots. That represents about 3% of the counties in the United States. So when you see that it basically looks like the whole state is red, I do think that that can have uh, uh, a, a, a mixed message for the public health response. I remember, for example, in my days as an AIDS researcher, when the messaging came out to the African-American male that happens to have sex with men, that you have a 50% lifetime risk of getting infected. Many young people just assume that that prevention didn't really play a major role in their lives because the risk was so high. I think it's important that we be very granular in understanding where we're having this transmission risk. I think it's very important we continue to try to figure out effective public health messaging for the younger group. But let me ask Jay what his comments would be. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Dr. Redfield. Uh, one of the things that I will add is, uh, as we look at the cases that have occurred over the past, past month, uh, compared to those that occurred in the month before that, we are seeing a greater proportion of cases that are being diagnosed in younger people. And this could reflect a number of things, including the fact that uh, people actually are hearing and understanding the messages, including the message that people who are uh, at higher risk need to take more precautions. So it's possible that we're seeing a smaller proportion of infections in uh, older people because there actually is less exposure. Uh, I think the, the question of how to best uh, communicate these messages to uh, younger people uh, is uh, one that uh, I'll defer to health communications uh, experts. But uh, earlier this week, uh, the MMWR put out a report about a cluster of effect infections that occurred in college students uh, returning from uh, spring break. So I think getting uh, that message out that uh, young people are not uh, somehow naturally immune to this new virus, although they may be at lower risk of death or severe infection, uh, doesn't uh, mean that they uh, are completely uh, unable to uh, become infected or to potentially transmit it to, to others. Uh, so I, I think being able to uh, get that message out more clearly than probably I just tried to articulate it is very important. Thank you. Could I, could I follow up, please? Um, you know, it sounds, Dr. Redfield, like you are actually sort of playing down the significance of the situation that is occurring in the southern and eastern or western United States. I mean, Texas is now in a situation where they're deferring um, elective surgeries again, or not again in their case, but deferring elective surgeries because of the, the, the stress on hospitals. Um, there's a lot of virus spreading in parts of the United States, and if it's spreading among young people, it won't stop spreading just among young people. They will infect other people. That's the way this works. I'm, I'm a little surprised that you see... Yeah, Helen, seeing... I think you're misunderstanding me. I'm not playing it down at all. This is a significant event. We, we obviously are concerned. I was trying to get people to understand there's cases and consequences. It's not the under play the cases. We have significant increase in cases. We need to understand that. We need to try to interrupt that, and we're going to continue to do that. But I was trying to do in contrast to where we were, say, in March, where we had obviously cases, hospitalizations, and deaths that were greater than now. If you look back uh, about eight to ten weeks, it was shocking to me that over 27% of all deaths that occurred in the United States occurred in somebody that died of a pneumonia, influenza, or coronavirus. 27%, one in four, all right? Today, we're back to the baseline where it's about 7%. So uh, I really hope that you don't misinterpret or misrepresent what I'm saying. This is still serious. It's significant. Uh, everything you said, we may have a lag in in what we see in hospitalizations and deaths because that can lag by three or four weeks. But I'm asking people to recognize that we're we're in a different situation today than we were in March and April, uh, where the virus was disproportionately being recognized in 
older individuals with significant comorbidities that was causing significant hospitalizations and deaths. Today, we're seeing more virus. It's in younger individuals. Uh, fewer of those individuals are requiring uh, the hospitalizations and having a, a fatal outcome, but that is not to minimize it. I think if you listen careful to me, uh, I am one of the individuals that's highly concerned about the complexity that we're going to be facing in the fall and with the coronavirus and when we have um, influenza. Um, I'm also, you know, I think it's important to recognize we're not talking about a second wave right now. We're still in the first wave. And that first wave is taking different shapes. We're going to continue to respond. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that when we have outbreaks like we did in North Carolina and Alabama, uh, CDC um, provided uh, technical assistance and teams to help the local health departments. Those hot spots are beginning to turn around. But these hot spots that we see, um, um, don't minimize them. They're, they're significant. We need to respond to them. And as you see in certain areas, like in Houston, Texas, and I was in Arizona, uh, these cases are actually uh, now causing challenges, as you mentioned, in terms of hospitalization. So I am not minimizing it. It's a significant issue. I'm just trying to let individuals understand the distinction between where we were in March and April and where we are today. Next question, please. Thank you. The next question is from Leanne Winnick with CBS News. You may go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'd like to touch on two things you just said about the younger people um, and um, the prospect of lingering effects in both younger and older people. What are those concerns and how are you messaging to younger people? Is there not some kind of advertising campaign that's specifically targeted to younger people after now three months of grappling with this? Jay, do you want to comment on that since I spoke on the last one? Sure. Uh, so the question of uh, prolonged recovery is, is a very good one. Uh, we hear anecdotal reports of people who have persistent fatigue, uh, shortness of breath. Uh, so how long that will last is hard to say. Again, we're talking about uh, a new disease, so whether or not this could be something that could persist for more than a few months, uh, we don't yet know. There is work uh, that is uh, ongoing to create uh, a follow-up of people who have confirmed COVID-19 so that we can determine uh, better what some of those long-term effects are. In terms of uh, messaging to, to younger people, I think uh, you're exactly right that the message needs to include, uh, even if uh, there's not as much interest in the uh, risk of transmitting to those who are at higher risk, uh, everyone needs to understand that there is some risk of severe illness, including among younger people. Uh, the tools that can be used uh, include uh, social media. Uh, we're exploring uh, TikTok tools. Uh, PSAs are uh, a bit older, but uh, that is something that in the right media can help to reach younger people as well. Thank you. Next question, please. Um, can I just follow up if there's some TikToks that are out there, if you could flag those, if the press office could flag those to us? At, at this time, uh, we do not have any, but that's uh, something that we are uh, looking into. And, and I'm of the age, I, I have to stop and think, what is a TikTok? But I've learned that over the past month. Next question, please. Thank you. The next question is from Jeremy Olson with the Star Tribune. You may go ahead. Thanks for taking my question. I was just wondering, there are tracker apps now that exist, Google platforms, Android platforms, that could aid with the, the monitoring of these local hotspots and, and contact tracing. But it seems like it's been left to states, and it's really been a, a fledgling start with these apps. I'm wondering if there's been any federal or national effort to make use of this technology to improve our tracking? Go ahead, Jay. Sure. Uh, 
So there has been work to determine the utility of these devices. Uh, one of the challenges has been the, the willingness of members of the public to utilize uh, these devices. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it has a lot of promise. I think uh, it also has some uh, challenges. There are a large number of apps that are out there, uh, so we don't endorse any one of those. Uh, but the ultimate uh, uh, authority in uh, conducting contact tracing as well as case investigation is going to be at the uh, local, state, or tribal level. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you. The next question is from Maggie Fox with CNN. You may go ahead. Thanks, uh, Dr. Redfield. I was very intrigued by something you said that uh, for every case, every case that's tested positive, there might be ten that weren't detected. Can you expand on that? And I think you probably know the Wall Street Journal has said that the CDC estimates many millions more cases than have been diagnosed. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question. I mean, we have uh, one of the realities because this virus causes so much asymptomatic infection, you know, and again, we don't know the exact number. There's ranges between 20% as high as 80% in different groups, but clearly it causes significant asymptomatic infection. That the traditional approach of looking for symptomatic illness and diagnosing it is underestimated. Uh, the total amount of infections. And so now with the availability of serology, the ability to test for antibody, CDC has established uh, uh, surveillance throughout the United States using a variety of different mechanisms for serology. And that information now is is, is coming in and, and will continue as we, we look at the range, uh, for example, where you have a different range of percent infections, and say in the West, coast uh, where it may be limited, uh, say 1% or so, and then you have the northeast where it may be much more common. Uh, the estimates that we have right now that I mentioned, and again, this will continue with more and more surveillance, is that it's about 10 times more people have antibody in these jurisdictions that, that, that had documented infections. So that gives you an idea. You know, what the ultimate number is going to be, is it 5 to 1, is it 10 to 1, is it 12 to 1? But I think a, a good rough estimate right now is 10 to 1. And I just wanted to highlight that because at the beginning, we were seeing the diagnosing cases of individuals that presented in hospitals and emergency. Um, they were in nursing homes. And we were selecting for uh, symptomatic or uh, higher risk groups. There wasn't a lot of testing that was done of younger asymptomatic individuals. So I think it's important uh, for us to realize that, that, uh, that we probably recognized about 10% of the outbreak by the um, methods that were used to diagnose it between uh, March, April, and May. And I think uh, we are continuing to try to enhance surveillance systems for individuals that are asymptomatic to be able to start detecting that asymptomatic infection uh, more in real time. And may I follow up on that, please? Um, you, you're also talking about younger people um, becoming infected and perhaps they're at lower risk, but you've, you've also updated the list of people with the underlying conditions that place them at, under, at uh, higher risk. That includes pregnant women who, of course, by definition will be younger. And we also have a high rate of obesity and diabetes in our younger population. Can you talk about how not everybody is young and perfectly healthy and that perhaps the U.S younger population might be at a higher risk of complication? Yeah, I think it's a critical question. I'm going to let Dana and Jay chime in on it, but I think you've hit it. Um, I think we have to recognize the reality. Our nation uh, isn't as healthy as some other a a nations, particularly as you look at the issue of obesity or some of the chronic medical conditions. But I think Dana may talk about pregnancy. And, Jay, if you want to you uh, talk about the uh, the existence of comorbidities in younger populations. 
Sure, Dr. Redfield. Uh, and I think, again, it, it highlights the fact that younger people in no way are completely immune to the effects of uh, SARS-CoV-2, nor are they at zero risk of more severe manifestations. And among young people, that risk is uh, elevated in those with underlying illnesses uh, or health conditions, including things like uh, diabetes or uh, obesity. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, pregnancy, of course, is uh, going to be uh, always in uh, younger people. And so the emerging data on the uh, increased risk of more severe illness uh, among people who are pregnant is something that has become more uh, visible as we have increasing numbers of cases occurring. And I would anticipate that we'll get more granularity on the, our understanding of the degree of risk as we continue on and uh, we have uh, additional data. Um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Uh, Mini Delman to see if she has any additional comments on the risks associated with pregnancy. So thanks for your comment. We, we appreciate that. I, I think there's a good news, bad news picture here. The, the good news is that um, at least from the data we have thus far, pregnant women are not at an increased risk of death. And to, to your point, I think that's because um, there's, there are pregnant women are generally a younger population. So that, that's the good news. But we, we do see higher uh, rates of admission to the ICU and mechanical ventilation based on this, this data set that we have to date. And so we think it's very important to get the information out there that pregnant women need to take precautions um, uh, with regard to coming in contact with others, the number of people they come in contact with, wearing face coverings, social distancing. So we, we really think this is a pivotal moment to emphasize uh, those precautions that people can take as they're living their lives in the face of COVID. Next question, please. Thank you. The next question is from Allison Aubrey with NPR. You may go ahead. Hi, thanks so much for taking my call. Uh, one question a lot of our listeners is asking is how do I is how do I assess my own personal risk? And one factor to look at here, of course, is the spread in your community or your state. Um, but people are confused about the best metric to look at. One metric is of the severity of spread is the positivity rate. We see rising positivity rates in Arizona at 21%, South Carolina, multiple other Sunbelt states. New York is now down to single digits. The lower rate, of course, is the better. It's suggesting you're doing enough testing. Um, the World Health Organization says that you want to see a single-digit positivity rate. Does the CDC have guidance? Is there an agreed-upon threshold of what a um, a good po an acceptable positivity rate or what a low positivity rate is? Would it be three percent? Would it be five percent? Do you have a specific guidance, Dr. Butler? Yeah, I think the answer to that question is lower is better, uh, and that may be obvious, but again, there's no magic number above which we would say uh, everyone needs to take, uh, basically stay home, and no uh, number below which we would say uh, don't worry about this at all, unless that number is zero and there's a significant amount of testing that's uh, occurring. I think it's uh, maybe more important to look at some of the other metrics as well, such as uh, whether or not your local health department is reporting a significant number of uh, cases occurring, and also uh, talk, look at the trends. Is it on the upward uh, tra trajectory, or is it uh, coming back uh, down again? In terms of assessing uh, the risk uh, for uh, getting out into the community, I think you've touched on an important factor is what is the amount of transmission occurring in your community. Also, there's the issue of personal uh, assessment, and that's one of the real areas of focus in this discussion today, uh, thinking about increasing age, increases risk, also the presence of underlying uh, health conditions. And then finally, uh, where are you going to go uh, when you go out? Uh, being around fewer people is better than being around a greater number. Being able to keep a distance of at least six feet is better than being closer. Uh, probably it's better to be out of doors than indoors. Uh, and being around people who are using face coverings is likely better than being around those who do not. It's a lot of different variables, I recognize, but they all play an important role. Right, but just in helping people understand if 
the transmissions or cases are growing in their area. You just mentioned several different metrics. And I think what's confusing for folks is, like, everyone's saying, oh, check with your local health people to say, you know, our case is growing. What's the risk in your area? But there's no consistent way for people to do that. I know that, you know, Tom Friedman and others have suggested a sort of green light, orange light, red light for the amount of spread in your area. Some simple indicator that we know works in public health to signal to people what is the risk in my area? Are cases up? Are they down? I think there's a lot of interpretation you're asking people to do that they're not capable of doing. And I'm wondering if you might be able to, have you thought about sort of setting a consistent, easy signal for people to know what the risk is in their area? Yeah, I think the challenging words in that question is easy and simple uh, because we all want those, and that's certainly something that we continue to uh, look at the data to determine what are the, the best metrics. Um, you know, we, we've never had a coronavirus pandemic before. Uh, we are only a few months into this, so uh, that is a, a big focus of what we're trying to do is to be able to get the data together to give people the best advice possible. But at this point in time, there is not a simple answer to that question. Next question, please. Thank you. The next question is from Marilyn Marchione with the Associated Press. You may go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, I have two quick questions. Uh, the first is you've, you've reset the list of who is at high risk from coronavirus and added pregnant women, why did you not also include blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans, given all the findings about higher hospitalization and deaths uh, among racial and ethnic minorities? I have a second question as well. Jay? Yeah, uh, great to, to hear from you. So uh, we actually do have uh, some additional information coming out on the risks that are associated with uh, race and ethnicity, and uh, thank you for raising that uh, question as well. Uh, there are uh, increased risks of infection in certain uh, racial and ethnic groups. Uh, much of this may be driven on uh, by the fact that it is very difficult uh, for people of lower socioeconomic status to be able to do things like telework or to be able to maintain social distancing. And at lower socioeconomic uh, levels, uh, certain racial and ethnic groups are overrepresented. And so that is likely a major driver to why uh, we are not see we are seeing some uh, inequities in terms of the uh, the rates of infection and outcomes in some groups. Uh, someone said early on that uh, the pandemic is uh, a boat that we're all in. Uh, I think uh, the pandemic is a storm we're all out at sea together in, uh, but some of us are able to be in better boats than others. So uh, looking at how we can achieve uh, better health equity is a big part of what we need to do. And my other question is for Dr. Redfield about the the, um, the new estimate that was just released that 20 million Americans have been infected. Is that a CDC estimate? Did the CDC come up with that? And what can you tell us about where the zero surveys were done, if they were nationally representative or just in hot, hot spots, how you've uh, determined this 20 million? And if, if that would mean about 6% of the population has been infected, and doesn't that mean the vast majority remain susceptible, and, and these are lower than the 25% asymptomatic uh, estimates we've been hearing. Yeah, I think uh, we're, we're still on, you know, collecting serological data. It is national surveys that are represented across the nation. Uh, we continue to add uh, samples to those surveys, uh, you know, uh, each, each month to continue to look to see what the extent is. There is great variability, uh, and I'm you know, confident at some time in the near future that um, that will be collated into information that can be broadly shared through the MMWR. Um, I think uh, two points important. One, the one that you said at the end, um, it's clear that um, many uh, individuals in this nation are still susceptible. Um, there are, as I mentioned before, um, uh, states that are going to have uh, antibody prevalence rates of uh, less than 2%, which would mean a majority of those individuals in those regions are still susceptible. There's other areas like the New York metropolitan area that clearly had a higher penetration 
of antibody uh, positivity and and we'll have uh, um, fewer individuals that will remain susceptible. But all in all, I think uh, you know, you're in the right range that somewhere between five, six, seven, eight percent of the American public um, um, had experienced infection, whether they recognized it or not. The estimate that we have given you at this point is that it appears that the rate is, and this is CDC's serology data, that the rate is approximately uh, 10 zero positive antibody individuals for every one case. Uh, obviously, that will be refined in the weeks ahead, but I think that's the range we're in. So you're, you're, you're right. Looks like that somewhere between 5 and 8% of the American public, um, that will be refined. And it does suggest uh, the critical point that you point out, and this is why we want to continue to reemphasize, this outbreak is not over. This pandemic is not over. The most powerful tool that we have, the powerful weapon, is social distancing. The virus doesn't like to, it's not efficient at going, you know, six, seven, ten feet between individuals. So if we can maintain the six, six feet distancing, if we can, if we can wear face coverings when we're in public, particularly when we can't maintain uh, the distancing, but we recommend them in public, and maintain vigilance in our hand hygiene so we don't end up self-inoculating ourselves from different surfaces that were contaminated. Uh, it's really important. It's really uh, powerful tools. And as we go into the fall and the winter, these are going to be really, really important uh, defense mechanisms for you, cause, uh, for all of us, because as you pointed out, a significant majority of the American public, probably greater than somewhere be greater than 90 percent of the American public hasn't experienced this uh, virus yet and yet remains susceptible. And can Next you tell question. us that the sera surveys that were nationwide, you said they were nas nationally representative. Have, have you done, do you have blood work from, you know, half of the states or, or just help us understand? Well, the, 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 way is, the way this is being done, and we can give you more information on, we have um, surveys that are being done uh, through uh, samples that were collected for other reasons, whether it's blood banks or laboratory testing, and then they are, they've been sampled in a representative way across the nation. Uh, and that, that process is continuing. There's additional, um, uh, what, uh, additional proposals, additional projects, uh, protocols that are actually being added to continue to make it more and more representative across this nation so that we'll have a pretty uh, complete understanding uh, as we get through this over the next months, uh, the next month or two, but we have a pretty good representation already across the country through blood banks and other sampling sites that we've done around the country. Next question, please. Thank you. The next question is from Elizabeth Weiss with USA Today. You may go ahead. Hi. Thanks for taking my question, and uh, so happy that we get to uh, have these briefings with you all. Um, I've uh, had two questions on pregnancy, and I wanted to get the correct spelling of Dr. Delman's name. Uh, the first question is, do we have any data on outcomes for the babies yet? Uh, probably not, because there hasn't been enough time for many women to actually give birth. And secondly, do we have any data on the where where in pregnancy you get sick and whether that affects um, either your outcome, the woman's outcome, or the fetus's outcome. I'm thinking of things like German measles and wondering if there are any cognates there. So thank you for the, those terrific questions. Many of the same ones we're facing here, as you alluded to, pregnancy is nine months, so um, we don't have a lot of the data that we need given where we are in the outbreak. Um, so I don't think we know the answer to the outcome uh, of outcomes of pregnancy specific to COVID-19. We do know that other infections increase the risk for uh, things like preterm birth. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if, um, if that's a risk factor here, but we need more data and we need more time to collect um, that information about outcomes. In terms of timing, the, the uh, MMWR that's coming out uh, shortly um, did not collect information about trimester. Um, so uh, it's, it's hard to know at this point. Um, a good move uh, during this pandemic is that we are collecting pregnancy status as part of our surveillance data from states. 
um, in a much, much more robust, robust fashion, and we are going to follow along with more information about gestational age. Um, given that this is a, a, a um, surveillance data point, my suspicion is that we probably have more women in the third trimester than in the first trimester from this, this surveillance data, just because it's easier to identify someone in the third trimester that's pregnant than in the first trimester. But we don't actually have uh, the, uh, the data yet. Um, and it would make sense based on the physiology in the third trimester and limitations on respiratory function uh, since this is a respiratory virus. I think they emailed you my information, uh, so let us know if you don't have that. Next question, please. Great, thanks. Thank you. The next question is from Ronnie Rabin you may, with uh, New York Times. You may go ahead. Yeah, I was curious about, it seems you're di uh, downgrading the risk of, um, of hypertension. This has been up there along with diabetes um, since the beginning of the outbreak in China as a as a risk factor that uh, that that increases the the risk for severe COVID nineteen illness and I'm just wondering uh, what's caused the change and and obviously you also seem to be have put obesity up up higher again if you can discuss that a bit a, a little bit more about um, the concerns for for the U S where obesity rates are so high and also among young people. Great question. Jay, you want to go ahead and expand on that? Sure. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to clarify a bit. So we're really talking about the strength of evidence uh, rather than the downgrading or upgrading the, the level of risk. Uh, and the question of hypertension is one that came up very early on, uh, even as we were receiving some of the early data out of uh, China. Uh, and I think what we've been able to do as more data has become available, recognizing that hypertension is a risk factor for other diseases such as heart disease, chronic kidney failure, we've been able to tease apart a little more uh, how much just having hypertension alone as opposed to having some of those end organ manifestations of hypertension may be uh, driving the increased risk. So does, this, does the same go, go for obesity then? I mean, obesity, you've, you've, you've actually separated it as a, as a risk factor in and of itself. Yes, and it uh, does, of course, uh, interact with some of the other uh, issues uh, such as diabetes, but uh, also I want to just highlight that uh, early on it was most obvious among people who had severe obesity, that is a body mass index above uh, 40. As we have more data, uh, it appears that uh, even uh, obesity uh, at uh, lower levels, such as a body mass index above 30, may increase the, the risk as well. So uh, obesity is appropriate to include as one of those conditions where there might be an, an increased risk. Next question, please. Thank you. The next question is from Tom Howell with the Washington Times. You may go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks for doing the call. Um, I just wanted to be clear on the list of underlying conditions. Can you tell us which conditions are new? You said it's an updated list. Um, maybe you said I just want to understand which ones have been added. And also you mentioned July 4th is coming up. Uh, what are your concerns in terms of gatherings, cookouts, et cetera, uh, fireworks, um, and what should people uh, do to to take care of themselves. Thanks. Jay, why don't you go ahead and answer that too, thanks. Sure. Uh, in terms of uh, what is uh, new, again, it's a little bit complex because some of it is uh, rearranging based on the strength of the evidence and the stratification there. So it may be best just to uh, get back with you uh, on that. Uh, regarding the upcoming 4th of July holiday, again, the, uh, the issues are, are the same in terms of how you can reduce your level of risk. Uh, gatherings that are smaller are better than gatherings that are large. Being able to uh, maintain uh, social distance uh, or physical distance 
uh, at least six feet is better than being in closer proximity. Uh, being outdoors is probably better than being indoors. Uh, and being a around people who are wearing face coverings is better than uh, not uh, around those, around people who are not uh, utilizing face coverings. Uh, so we do recognize that families will want to be together over the holidays, but uh, being able to minimize the, the people that you are around, particularly people that you have not been around uh, in the past is particularly important. And to reinforce the the message, because there are going to be family gatherings, how important it is, you know, what we stressed even back in March, just to reemphasize that message that we have responsibility to uh, practice the uh, social mitigation strategies to protect the vulnerable, to protect the elderly. I will also just say, you know, a lot of us may not even know uh, which one of our close friends uh, have, or even family members, may have some of these significant medical comorbidities. So I think, again, stressing the importance that we all have a critical role, not for ourselves per se, but to protect the vulnerable. And I've said it before, I've been really uh, uh, proud and congratulate the American public. I think most of us you know, back in March, and we did the 15 days to slow the spread, and then the 30 days to slow the spread. Um, I'm not sure all of us really believe that the American public was going to listen and buy into it. As a physician, which I am, I've worked uh, over my lifetime to help my patients stop smoking or lose weight or exercise more or, uh, uh, you know, do other things to improve their health. And it's very hard to be able to affect behavioral change as a physician when you're asking someone to you know, do this to improve their own health. But I think it really was remarkable that the American people uh, really did uh, embrace the mitigation steps when the consequence was to uh, protect the health of somebody else. Uh, we're asking that again. Uh, we really think that's important. This is one of the complexities now with uh, the younger individuals uh, as they, we see these infection case numbers go up. Uh, it's just really important. And so for the 4th of July, which is a family event, we want to reemphasize that it's really important that we get back to being vigilant into our, our collective commitment to, you know, do these social mitigation steps to protect the, the vulnerable friends, family, community, uh, and those individuals that we don't know that we're interacting with uh, from uh, potentially getting infected and having a, uh, a poor uh, negative outcome because of their comorbidities. So we have time for two more questions, please. Thank you. Our next question is from Donna Young with SMP Global News. You may go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate you taking my question and holding the call today. Um, this question is for Dr. Redfield. Um, Dr. Redfield, um, are you willing to admit that it was a mistake to dismiss um, Dr. Messonnier's February 25th warnings um, to hold that press conference that HHS held later in the day where um, the officials there, including Dr. Fauci, tried to minimize what she said, um, tried to say that it was education for the future, but nothing that people needed to be doing at that point, um, and that you, as well as Dr. Fauci, all throughout January, February, and well into March, were advising Americans that they needed that they did not need to make any behavioral changes or any changes to their daily activities, um, as well as also ask, I wanted to ask about the masks. Um, why did you think later that there was a difference in wearing a cloth mask um, later on that that was okay, but officials were shaming Americans early on for wearing most of them, you know, cloth masks. Um, why why um, was that shaming actually going on? But, um, but if you could, you know, please, uh, it, it seems like you're able to say now, well, you know, it's a new virus, we didn't know what was going on. But early on, it seemed like you were very willing to say, 
there's no need to wear a mask. Um, you know, we're right about this and, and, and pretty much dismissed Dr. Messinier, um, for what she, well, actually did dismiss, um, Americans were pretty much told to ignore that for now. That's something for the future. Education, you know, for the future, but don't pay attention to her today on February 25th. So, thank you. Donna, this is Benjamin. I will follow up with you on the question after the briefing. Sue, can you give us the last question, please? Sure. The last question is from Will Fewer with CNBC. You may go ahead. Hi. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I, I do think that I speak for all of us though, to say that I am interested to hear the, the answer to the previous question, uh, but my question is about contact tracing. Uh, Dr. Redfield, you testified earlier this week there's about 27 or 28,000 contact tracers uh, deployed now across the nation. I'm wondering, though, and you said you're going to ramp that up, what is the goal there? And I know that's, that number shifts and that the goal might shift depending on the uh, epidemics around the country. Uh, but, you know, roughly what kind of number are you looking for with the number of contact tracers? And, you know, how I understand it's mostly a, a, an effort run by local health departments. So what's the CDC doing to support local health departments in ramping up capacity to conduct contact tracing? Thank you very much. A very important question. Um, and it's important, it's not just contact tracing, but it's the consequence of that to have the ability to isolate uh, individuals. Um, you know, in January, the estimate of the country was there was about the health departments collectively had about 6,000 individuals that were in this contact tracing space. Um, I think the 2nd of January, when the states were polled, by intergovernment affairs, it was now almost 28,000, I think 27,800 in approximately. Uh, if you ask the states what they think they need when they've been all polled, it's close to 77, 78,000. I've estimated that I think the, the nation's going to need close to 100,000 in this space. Um, you know, Tom Friedman has estimated he thought as high as 300,000. I think we have to work uh, as we begin to build this workforce capacity um, and to get it in place uh, and get those individuals. Um, the efforts that we have, and again, Congress has been, um, you know, I think provided leadership in this regard. They've provided CDC uh, um, significant resources. We've dispersed 10 billion, $250 million from Congress to the states so that they can augment their testing, contact tracing, and isolation capability. Uh, the states have put together their plans for June and July, which have undergone review and, 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 and areas of weakness have been discussed so they can correct them, and then they'll have their formal plans for basically the rest of the year due on the 10th of July. Significant human resource, uh, significant financial resources to help them. CDC has obviously embedded people. We have over 650 people embedded now in, in the state and local ter tribal territory health departments. We've augmented, we've offered the states the opportunity to hire additional individuals through our foundation. We've obviously given them their own resources to hire. AmeriCorps now is making AmeriCorps volunteers available. Some of the states have used other uh, state employees. Some of the states have uh, looked at different strategies. So we're going to continue. I think one of the critical things to do in parallel, though, is we can't just build contact tracing. you got to build the capacity to isolate people. And it's important to be able to isolate people that live in congregate living settings or that live in a setting that would then put another individual significantly at risk so they 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 couldn't, in fact, uh, minimize the risk to an elderly parent or grandparent. Obviously, that's another issue in isolating individuals that are uh, homeless. So uh, this 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 has to be built. I think that the bottom line that I like to tell people is, for decades, uh, this nation has underinvested underinvested in the core capabilities of public health, whether it's data data analytics and predictive data analysis, whether it's resilience in the public health laboratories across our country, whether it's the public health workforce that we just talked about. Uh, obviously, whether it's related to emergency funding to respond in a timely fashion. Um, but, I, you know, that will continue to be the core and being able to effectively operationalize the contact tracing and isolation that's going to be required. And, 
Yes, it is going to be different plans by different states that are trying to put those, and we will continue to provide guidance, technical assistance, uh, training manuals, training curriculum to get these contact tracers um, in place uh, uh, over the summer. Thank you, Dr. Redfield. Thank you, Dr. Butler, and thank you, Dr. Gelman. And thank you all for joining us for today's briefing. As I mentioned at the start of the briefing, the information we just shared is embargoed until 1 p.m. Um, please check CDC's COVID-19 website for the latest updates on CDC's response efforts, and an audio recording and transcript of this briefing will be posted on the CDC newsroom at www.cdc.gov slash media. If you have further questions, please call the main media line at 404-639-3286. Email media at cdc.gov. Thank you. Thank you. That does conclude today's conference. Thank you all for participating. You may now disconnect.